All right. Things are pretty good, pretty quiet in the neighborhood right now, um, fortunately. So we're good right now. Everybody doing well? Keith, where are you, Keith? You say good evening. So I'm just, are you in England? I forget. I know you told me at one point, but I've, for, I've forgotten where you are. Roger's in California, I'm pretty sure. Bonnie and, you know, I'm not sure where Bonnie and Jim are from. I for, but for some reason, I have Ohio in my head. I don't know why. I'm vision, I, I kind of have a vision of everybody. I'm pretty sure Pepper is in like uh, Alabama or Mississippi. She's in the South. Man, I, I think the worst rainstorm I ever got caught in was in, was it in Alabama? Let's see, uh, Birmingham. Yeah, Birmingham, Alabama. Man, I was, I was, uh, oh, touched my face. Take a sip. Oh, you're <laughs> close. I wasn't even close. The state began with an O, but other than that, so you're in my time zone. Okay, I didn't know that. I guess you do say lunch, though. You're getting lunch. Why is my... It's weird. I'm, I guess I sit further back normally. Anyway, uh, Ed's here. Um, hey, Bill, Bill Kirkley. Hello from northern Minnesota. Nice. I've got a friend, uh, Brad Ray, uh, Bradley, Brad Ray, that lives in northern Minnesota. I went to high school with him, and he played in my <laughs> band in high school <laughs> called Rendezvous. That's not a sippable offense. That's one of the rules. We have a drinking game here. If I touch my face, we can take a drink. There's 10 rules now. If I drop my pick, you get to take a drink. If I drop a thumb pick, it's actually you get to take two drinks. I don't even have a thumb pick right now. Oh, there's one. Yeah, but you should never drop a thumb pick. Um, and if I say I had a band in high school called, and then fill in the blank, uh, then you can, um, you can take a sip. Uh, if I mention that I played all the guitars on Apex Legends, you can uh, take a sip. Um, Joe Lou. And... Oh, you're in, yeah, in Essex. Okay. I was just I just taught a lesson to my student in London. Actually, they're outside of London right now, but they have a place in London. Um, and he uh, uh, at like. Ate my time, which was four to his time. He had just finished school for the day. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry. I got a text I got to look at here real quick. Uh, so... Um, Tennessee. Oh, Ed, you're, or Eric, you're in Tennessee. Very nice. You know, you, you would think I've been to Nashville, but I've never been to Nashville. We had in, in the 90s, uh, or mid 90s, early 90s, after the earthquake and the riots, <laughs> we had a lot of friends that got out of California. And trust me, we're thinking about it. But um, they, uh, um, uh, they moved to Nashville and they wanted us to move with them. And I really was like, nah. I can't do it because uh, I uh, um, it just felt like I wasn't a very good country player and I felt like um, uh, uh, 
we do, uh, you know, it, it just, I, I feel like you have to be a pretty good country player to be in, sorry, there was a squirrel moment there, uh, to, to kind of survive in Nashville. And it's a very clicky, I mean, LA is weird because I run in like 20 different circles. That's the beauty of LA. You know, I work on, uh, like hip hop records and then I work on K pop records and then I work on, uh, Latin records, you know, Spanish records and, uh, and then I work on pop records and it's just, uh, all these camps, they don't know each other. It's, it's so weird. I run in like 20 different circles and then I work with TV people and I work with film people and, and the film people all know each other and the TV people all know each other and the hip hop people all know each other. Uh, but I just kind of bounce around from one camp to the other. Everybody seems to dig what I do, so uh, I'm happy to oblige. oblige. Uh, but I feel like Nashville will be a little bit smaller world in that regard. So everybody's uh, saying hello to each other. Verdi's here. Yeah, I hear Nashville's getting crowded, yeah. Well, a lot of Californians moved there in the 90s, like I said. Everybody's getting all their hellos in. Um, Gary. Hello, Gary. Leo. Jim Lee. There's Jim. Bavar. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Uh, Bonnie Lee. Keith. Everybody. <laughs> Guys, we're all just like, I swear, we should, we gotta, we gotta do a meetup at some point. Would that be crazy? I just watched, uh, yesterday, I did. Uh, or night, night before last, I watched a documentary. <laughs> Have you seen that? The Bill Murray one where he, uh, Bill Murray just kind of shows up at places, like shows up at a party and goes in the kitchen and does the dishes and then leaves. <laughs> it's on Netflix. If you just enter Bill Murray, you'll see it. So we were talking about chord progressions and we were in the key of G before and I'm going to probably stay with the key of G for now. And, you know, it, songwriting and songs and the, the beauty of, of, of the fact that you've got harmony, you've got rhythm, you've got melody, you've got lyrics, you've got arrangements, uh, you've got production, you've got instrumentation, um, you've got personalities. Those all uh, just, you know, multiply against each other to create an infinite number of possibilities. You know, I was thinking about this the other day after we did the first, um, um, we did that first lesson I was just talking about basic, and I'm going to do more on that, um, but taking a very basic one, six, four, five progression, um, speaking of Nashville, uh, but like for example, G to E minor to C to D, and I flipped, you just take any two chords in there and reverse them. So instead of G to E minor, C, D, you have E minor to G. And you have a new progression, a different progression that you can use to write over. And, and a lot of times, what, what I like to do, um, let's do this right now, in fact. Um, so... Um, so we did, the, so here's that, that you can see on this piece of paper, that first progression, G, E minor, C, D. That's a one, six, four, five in the key of G. Um, we reversed those first two and came up with E minor to G. And then, and then I reversed the second two and came up with D, C instead of C, D. Okay. So what I can do though, what's interesting is I could write a melody over this progression and then change it to this progression and keep the melody the same and see if it works. Now, if I'm doing notes that are really in, that fit really well here um, in the melody, then when I get here, there are going to be notes that maybe don't fit as well. But you can, when you hear that, when you, when you hear me say that the notes don't fit as well, you're basically what I'm saying is it's a melody you never would have written. 
Um, and so that's an actual really good uh, skill and a good thing to be able to do or to do because most people write melodies that sound like something else. Well, if we change it, I could even maybe write some melody um, that, you know, Okay, so I basically just followed the, you know, B, G, I went one, two, three, three, two, one, three, two, one, one, two, three, da, 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 and it landed on the two of the key for the D chord. Okay, now if I did that over this, over di the, the third progression there, which is E minor, G, D, C, it would sound like this. And you know, that, the, the da 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 wouldn't work so well over the D chord, but it's okay. It doesn't, it's not horrible because you know you're in the key of G and it makes sense. And then when I got to that C chord, I was singing the A. So I was actually singing the sixth of the chord, which is a melody note you might not have sung over a C chord normally. Um, so I find that to be a real helpful tool. And you might not have to change, flip two sets of chords. You could flip just one. We could set, flip just the middle ones. So if I did, instead of doing uh, G, E minor, C, D, I could do G, C, E minor, D. So I flipped these two, right? Boop, like that. Well, that'll definitely work. Whatever, you can go anywhere from there. Um, and so it's a kind of a, a way to trick yourself into writing more interesting melodies that get away from things that you're, you know, you're trapped in. I like to do the same thing with, um, uh, with rhythms. Like, for example, on that melody, every one of those melodies started on B2, right? Um, so maybe if I want to trick myself into doing a different, to changing how I would normally write a melody, then I move that an eighth note either sooner or later. So if it were a sooner, you know, like that, where it's like, ba ba ba, ba ba ba. Well, actually, I moved it back. Uh, T four one. Two. Let's see, one two three four one. Ba ba ba, ba ba ba. Bum, bum, bum. You know, and you move the melody and it changes. It, because we also were creatures of just habit. And I, I've, um, uh, I don't, see, Diane, if you can remember. Where's Diane? I know I saw Diane. Uh, we're talking about chord progressions, not substitutions yet, necessarily. We're, we're talking about, sorry, touch my face, so take a drink. I got some food in my teeth. We, um, we, we're basically talking about, we'll, you know, we'll get to chord substitutions, but really we're talking about analyzing pre-existing chord progressions and, and, a lot, and then writing too as well. So that's pretty much what we're, what we're talking about. But Diane's here. Okay. So remind me, if you can, when it's story time to tell the story about, uh, let's see, um, just say Pete. Okay. I won't, I won't name names. Pete's already too much. <laughs> but. Um, but if you can create, you know, um, there are so many ways to, to change things to make it more interesting. We talked about this with the strumming patterns. Like I said, it, you know, the, the elements of a song are, are a lot more than you think they are. I mean, they're, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's the words. No, it's the words and the melody. Oh, it's the chords, too. Yeah, and it's the tempo. Tempo is a big factor. Um, th take, for example, um, this is old school right here, but... Right? 
the Johnny Carson theme. Um, they played it up-tempo, but that was actually a Paul Anka tune from the 50s, I believe, maybe the 60s, um, that was... Da, 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 da. It was a ballad. Um, and so you, you almost wouldn't have recognized. If you'd heard the ballad, you, you know, after hearing Johnny Carson theme for a million years, you probably wouldn't even go, well, wait a minute, that sounds vaguely familiar, but you put, couldn't peg it. So tempo's a factor, but rhythm is too. Um, so like, for example, that... Da, 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 da. If, I, if I stretch that out more, I went... Da, 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 da. Um, that would be, uh, you know, have a different feel than that. The second, the, the faster version is almost more joyful, right? This one's almost more dirge-like, you know. Especially if I start on the E minor. sing that six over the over the a chord i mean over the c chord um so there's so many elements and of course lyrics you know songs can you can't copyright i love you um you know you just those lyrics you couldn't copyright but you but i always consider the melody and the lyrics to be the most copyrightable part of a song um, obviously, if the song is just I love you or something like that over and over again, then you're, you're not going to win in court when you sue someone as I love you in their song. Um, but uh, the combination of the melody and the lyrics, uh, I think, are the, are the most uh, integral part of the song as far as it being considered uh, a copyrightable thing, if that makes any sense. Okay, the, the, um, uh, and then the rhythm thing is totally... A huge, huge factor. Um, like if I play uh, this progression, I'll do it in G. I'm going to be in G. So it. Now I'm not in G. I'm in C, but I'm kind of going. And that was basically a G. Um, and don't, no. <laughs> there's no, oh, I created, uh, there, there, is, there won't be a quiz on this uh, merchandise, okay? So I, I will, uh, shoot, I will, I'm trying to figure out how I can get it in the video uh, on the YouTube thing as a way to do it. I went through YouTube to create it. So we have a bunch of merchandise like t-shirts and Coffee mugs is the best one. You hold a coffee mug and it says there won't be a quiz on this and you're, you're having coffee with someone. And it's pretty funny, actually. I think, I, think, uh, I, think, uh, um, I think you'll dig it. But it's a little, on I mean, my side, it's a little expensive. It's like $15 for a coffee mug or maybe, yeah, something like that plus $5 shipping. It's like 20 bucks for a coffee mug. It's kind of ridiculous, in my opinion. Because um, uh, somebody will be buying them 10 years from now at a, at a thrift store for 50 cents. But... Um, but and I think I make seven dollars or something like that. It's something like that. It's like fifteen dollars and I make seven or something. So which is cool, you know. I won't turn it down. Um, but uh, the um, progression I just played was, like I said, there's no quiz on this. This is a one chord. This is a flat major seven. Then it went to a six chord, E minor, and it went to the four chord. Well, that's kind of a weird progression, right? Yeah, it's pretty weird. How about this? Some of you might not recognize that song. I did that in a band. So in my band in high school, we did that song. Um, and that's not a sippable offense, people. What did I... Oh, I said no quiz on this. Yeah. So, cheers. <laughs> yeah, you better get a gallon mug. It would be funny, though, if we all got the, all got the mugs and then we're drinking from them. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, I can post a link um, on the Discord... 
later so you can go buy any merchandise. I mean, it was like the t-shirts weren't bad. They were more like $22, $23 or whatever. Um, but basically, I just created, it was just Helvetica, very simple. Uh, very, very simple. I like it, actually. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a conversation started, to say the least, to walk around a shirt with, there won't be a quiz on this. It's like people are like, wait, what? <laughs> so. Okay, so you can see where that one flat major seven, uh, six, four progression, in that context, they didn't think about that. When they wrote it, they weren't thinking, oh, you know, we should go to the flat. No, that's just like, um, that's just a, they just were jamming and they came up with that. You know, it wasn't, wasn't, um, it wasn't really a consideration what kind of chords they were in relation to the key. Um, and somebody comes along later, like me, and analyzes and goes, oh, well, that's the uh, root to the flat major seven and to the bottom six, and boom, you know, and that's how you make that progression, you know. But that's not how they arrived at it, I guarantee it. Most songs aren't derived from theory. Most, the most of the time, theory is used to explain the songs. Um, so, so that was... That F is the first time we've seen a chord that hasn't been in the key of, of G. Now, I could do, for example, um, the F creates kind of an amen cadence with a C, right? Amen. And then the C is the amen to the G, right? So I could do a progression where I'm like, uh, G. And I'm very clearly in G. Of one, six, four, five, and then we have. Actually, it sounds good to go to the D there, right? To the five chord, and then back to the beginning. You've heard that before, and that's a flat major seven. Uh, probably the most common use for the flat major seven is actually coming from the flat major six, and you've heard that a lot. Now in G, it's a little hard because that's E flat major to F major to G major, okay? But I'll play it so you can hear the context. But it's like... Right? And we're going to get into the... We're going to get deeper into that. We're, right now, we're just talking about one, two, three, four, five, and six. Uh, those chords in that progression. Now let's look at another progression. Um, we'll do it in the key of G. I don't think it was originally in the key of G. And I'm going to add sevenths just for the sake of you hearing the song a little bit better. Um, so I'm going to play G major seven to A minor seven to B minor seven to C major seven. And that's Here, There, and Everywhere by the Beatles, basically Paul McCartney. But it's also... Uh, So one was 60s, and the other one was 80s. Um, shoot. Uh, I can... Okay, okay. Love Cats. Who's that group? Dang it. Somebody's got it. Oh, sorry. Can you explain Old Town Road? Um, probably. And in fact, a lot of times, uh, if you want to do... Um, you want to create a bluesy sound or a western sound or a uh, kind of a, 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 a wailing or sad sound, which is what the blues kind of is, is to sing a minor scale over a major or play. We talked about this before, playing, you know, playing a minor pentatonic over a major chord. Yeah, so that's definitely intentional, and that's very common. Uh, uh, but as far as Old Town Road, I'm trying to think of how it goes, uh, to be honest. I know the song. It was huge, huge smash. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Maybe we can bring that up on Monday. The Cure. Thank you, Leo. Gosh. Boys don't cry. Yep. Um, and so, um, but there's an example of a one, two, three, four progression, okay? G is the one chord. A minor is the two chord. B minor is the three chord, and C is the four chord. All right. So, let's see. Um, doo -doo. All right. All 
All right, so let's look at, I can write on the back of this. Let's tear this off. All right, so G, A minor, B minor, and C. And you know, normally when you would do a climbing progression like that, you wouldn't use B minor. You'd be more likely to use G over B. All right. Um, for example, right? That kind of has a softer sound to it. It's not as weird. It's a little bit more you know, uh, folky, okay? But when, when, when the Cure used, it was almost like they were going, oh, I know, we know music theory. That's the two, three chord is B minor. See? Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Avito, uh, Avito, you could... Yeah, you can totally end a song that way. There's a million ways to end songs. Um, and uh, you can always um, end a song with a different progression than you've ever used in the song. Like how many songs end with that? And they've never actually played that progression throughout the entire song, but at the very end, they just go to that flat major six to the flat major seven to the one chord. Um, and uh, like I said, we're gonna talk about those you know, in the, in the coming lessons. Um, but let's look at that. We can do some of the things that we talked about with flipping things around and, and then just listen to them, you know, what does it sound like? Well, what if we, this time, instead of flipping the first two chords, let's flip the second two chords. So we, we do a, a little X here and we go G to B minor, A minor and C. And if you you know, have a guitar in your hand, you can go ahead and play that and see, oh, yeah, that's not bad. It's kind of cool, interesting, different, you know. And, and it, it's, it doesn't, you don't have to stick to this. If you decide, you know what sounds really good here, instead of C, I think I'll play a D chord. Yeah, well, that's, oops, how did I do that? There we go. <laughs> so you could totally put a D chord there instead or alternate. You know, there are no rules when you're writing music. Um, and and when you, as you mess around with these progressions, you will start to hear them in songs. When you're hearing a song, like, I, you know, there's the, but I'm going to switch the middle two chords, so. Cool. The D sounds almost better, but again, rhythm is a, rhythm is a big factor, so check this out. I can totally change that groove because because that's a little bit boring to do one bar of each chord, right? So what I'm going to do is a dotted quarter note of the first chord, a dotted quarter note of the second chord, a quarter note of the third chord, and a full bar of the fourth chord. Uh, and I'll take the, the G, B minor, A minor, C. So that sounds like this. Right? In those situations, now, just like China Grove by the Doobie Brothers, there the chords became part of the hook. Those chords, in that manner, would be copyrightable. Do you see? You're actually creating a melodic idea, a movement, a rhythm. But if I played those same chords, um, like that, I'm just playing a, you know, and you could think of this as, if you thought of this progression in the key of A, then this would be five, four, uh, uh, three, one, five, four, three, one. Um, and if you, um, if you thought about it in that way, uh, you know, if you played it that way, that wouldn't really be, the progression itself wouldn't be particularly copyrightable, and it's not really very hooky, 
I used air quotes so we can take a sip. That's one of the rules. If I use air quotes, we can take a, a sip. All right. Yeah, flat five, uh, flat five, flat six and a four. I don't think I've ever heard that one in a song. Uh, in the key of G, flat five would be. Oh, wait, I see what you're saying. I've not heard that, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can come up with all the mathematical po possibilities. Um, and like I said, when you start to, you know, when we're looking at these progressions initially, we're really taking a very boring, you know, four beats of each chord kind of look at it, just so you can kind of hear how the. The chord leads to the next chord or whatever. Um, but let's say I, you know, let's take these this chord progression. Instead of having those two minor chords next to each other, let's start on the B minor. That would be kind of weird. Or no, I, I think I'll flip these two. Uh, so then we end up with C, A minor, G, B minor to start. Um, just want to make sure I'm not just duplicating this one up here starting on a different chord. Because you can also, that's another thing you can do is you could write a, if you, you could write a song uh, using one, two, three, four. And you could start the song on the two chord and just go from there. same exact progression but I started a bar later and kept the melody where it was and so what that and I didn't <laughs> I didn't know I was going to morph into songwriting but um it, but you know it's a it's a way to trick yourself into writing a melody you wouldn't have written so yeah I mean those chords definitely sound very punk yeah that's true um it, you know one of the greatest um in my opinion one of the greatest melody writers of all time is Kurt Cobain um, because he, I mean, you can tell it's a good melody if, uh, you hear it in a music version and it works, right? There's a, some songs that like, you know, they really don't work music. They're too, the melodies are a little boring. The chords are a little boring, whatever. Kurt Cobain wrote the most interesting melodies. I mean, I love, I don't know if you've watched, uh, Rick Beato's, uh, video on Teen Spirit, but. Uh, that that's a classic example of uh, hey alter no ego. <laughs> um, uh, the smells like Teen Spirit's a great melody, and almost all of his songs had really good melodies that you could take. Well, a classic proof of that is they did the unplug the MTV unplug thing, and those songs stood up. It wasn't all just screaming, yelling, intense chord progressions, volume. You know that wasn't the only thing they had to offer. You could take a lot of Sex Pistols tunes and put them in a slow context, and they're not really going to work very well. You know, it, 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 I mean, I'm sure somebody's done it, but um, a lot of times there's a lot of, and a lot of punk rock, and uh, Nirvana was kind of post-punk. Um, uh, it was grunge, but um, post-punk. Uh, they definitely trended towards melodies, just like, um, oh, uh, shoot. I can't think of the band. I, I don't. I don't think of them as really a punk band, although they kind of want to be called a punk band. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I've watched. I've watched that too. Very, um, so so good. Um, and so, like I said, Kurt's melodies were just amazing. Um, so anyway, um, so yeah. They, there's so many things you could do. Like I said, with this one, you know, you could, you could, like I said, you know, this progression, the one, two, three, four, I'll write that up here. Roman numeral one, capital one, small case. Um, you know, you could start on any one of those chords and create a, a new progression. Um, but then if you do, you know, if you change the rhythm, because like I said, the, the, the initial rhythm I played there was very just four beats of each chord and kind of boring. Uh, but if I took that, if I went, uh, you know, like, that 
that's much more of a chord progression that has a hook, and now you can write over that. Um, you know, and almost any melody that you wrote over any of those chords, which should work over that progression as it moves through the chords, so. Yeah, and I'm still, right now, I'm still talking about inside chords. So I want to talk about outside chords, but I kind of want to introduce them slowly, and I don't want to, you know, you, you can figure those out on your own if you want, but like the F was an outside chord for the key of G, but we're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, the five of the five, and the five of the five of the five, and all those things, and the minor four chord, and there's, you know, major three chord, major two chord, all these things. Uh, they're all t tools, but I, I kind of want to arrive at them. I don't want to just say, okay, so you can also do this, you can also do this, and just give you a bunch of different chords, and like, how do I work with them? You know, let's let's learn them a little bit at a time. So I really like that, you know, the one, two, three, four progression is cool. The one, six, four, five. Remember, we, we moved those around so that uh, we came up with like, I felt like the 90s was six, four, five, uh, sorry, six, four, one, five, you know. You know, you just kind of have these, so many songs in the 80s or 90s, actually, early 90s particularly, uh, kind of had that progression. Um, uh, and so, anyway, so that gives you some idea. Let's think of another one here. What's another? Um, four, six, one, five. playing in 6-8, so that also gives it a different feel, right? Um, so yeah, I moved where I put the chords. Same progression. Sounds like a different song. Yeah, I don't know, Leo, because I'm probably, I don't even remember what I'm doing. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I mean, let me open up the Discord page now, and I can type them in. Maybe I don't. Uh, as far as far as like these sheets, I, th these are just like you could totally do this. This is kind of um, this is just more of an exercise or a homework assignment for you guys to kind of come up with variations. Um, hey, Clem, long time no see. Um, but yeah, so so uh, let's see. And this was a different progression where instead of a C chord, we use an A minor chord, right? And that was a case of substitutions. Okay, well, let's talk about let's talk about substitutions um, that are um, in the key. Okay, so if I did a progression, we talked about this quite a while ago. Remember, we I was doing Lord, I lift your name on high, um, <laughs> where we went G C D C, right? Not A C D C, but G C D C. G, and my G's do look like A sometimes, so I can see where you might make that mistake. All right, so if you go down a half step and a whole step, or go down two scale tones from any one of these chords here at the bottom, okay, um, you have uh, the relative minor, okay? So down a half step, from G is F sharp, and down a whole step from F sharp is E, and you just put an M after it, and there's your substitute for G, okay? So E minor. If we go down a half step from C, we get B. If we go down a whole step from B, we get A minor for C. There's our sub, there's our minor, uh, relative minor is what it's called, relative minor substitution for a major chord. It also goes both ways. You can have a relative major. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then the D, you can go down a half step, you get C sharp, but there's no C sharp in the key of G. So we go down a whole step to get to C, and then down another note, and we get B, and that's so we build up chord on that, and B minor, totally in the key of G. As you know, it's the three chord. And so we went from, and then C again is A minor, we went from having a 1, 4, 5, 4 progression to having a 6, 2, 3, 2 progression. Okay? Oh, something's going on. 
sorry. Okay, so. Um, so pretty much any melody that works over the G, C, D, C will work over the E minor, A minor, B minor, for the most part. There might be some times where that G note, the root note, will rub a... Um, rub it weird against those uh, you can think down three semitones yeah the same thing i like to think down a veto i like to think down um the scale tones but you know and eventually you don't even need to think that you'll just know that e minor is the minor sub for g major and so on and so forth you won't have to figure it out it'll you'll just memorize it um and you can do that in point so like if i'm playing a song I sub E minor for the G. Kind of takes the song in a different direction. Right back to that. Now I could also sub the, the E minor for the D. Or I could sub the go back to the original progression. I could sub the A minor for the C. Um, and you, you can see you don't have to sub them all. You just sub one of them to make a difference. Um, and that's again another great songwriting tool. So you take write a song over this progression, and then you go, okay, you know what? I'm gonna change. Um, I'm gonna go. Well, if I change, <laughs> the funny thing is, if I if I go ahead and do, uh, if I change, oh, let's do the G. Okay, leave that the same. If I do the minor sub for the uh, C chord, uh, that would be A minor. And let's do a minor sub for the D chord, that would be B minor. Um, oh man, oh I see. All right, I think maybe it's done. I mean, I checked my speed earlier, it was like over two, two, uh, 220, uh, gigabytes per second, so it should be fun. I think we're good now. I'll keep it. I'll try to keep an eye. It's a little green box down here. So, um, so as I was saying, you know, if we took the minor subs here and we took the G, and left it alone. Did the oh, let's do an, a minor sub for the C and a minor sub for the D, but then go back to C. That would be the boys don't cry progression. It would be G A B. You know, G A minor B C. You'd end up with one, two, three, four. So, you know, you, you just never know what's going to happen when you start making these substitutions. The other thing you can do is you could play the song this way and then you could go to this way if you want or go to here or do this. You know, you can use any one of these paths to get to the end of the progression um, and keep the melody the same. Now, that's that's a whole nother and I that's a whole nother lecture there talking about melody writing. Um, the song that I think is such a great example, and I can't play it um, for you, unfortunately, but one of my favorite pop writers is Neo. And um, uh, let's see, YouTube, a song called Mad. Um, and I'm going to post a link here so you guys can check it out, maybe open the window. Um, here we go. And... Um, It's a great, you know, actually even the uh, the lyric is even on the uh, kind of spiritual, you know, Christian biblical side in that it basically the premise of the song is don't go, uh, don't go to bed angry. So let's see. Copy. All right. go all right this is I don't know who you are all right 
So, <laughs> I took the red pill. All right. So, that uh, song, okay, so the reason I posed that song has nothing to do with chord progression because it's actually a fairly boring chord progression. I'm trying to think of what the progression is. Let me look it up real quick because I can do that with that. Um, And I'm gonna have to go early today because I've got so much work to do. Okay, so it's looks like it's one. It's a beautiful chord progression. It's uh, one, five, two, four. And what he did over, and this is in the key of uh, C. What he did over it that, that's so amazing to me is that he is insanely generous with melodies. So in the pop world, the pop writers, the stars there, I mean, I always say the, 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 the real artists in pop world are the record producers because they're the ones that make it sound like something totally new, which is hard to do because it almost seems like everything's been done. But then you hear a new song come out and you're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, it sounds like something no one's ever heard before. And that's usually done at the hands of the producer. Um, and, uh, but the other rock stars, as far as I'm concerned, in pop music are the melody writers. <laughs> I can't tell you, well, so many, how, how many songs, I mean, I think of um, Home to Mama is a great example. I think Sam Hooke did a great job on that top line. He really came up with a, a really nice variety of melodies on that. And it just kind of, he, there are four distinctive melodies in that song. Uh, but on the Neo song, there's six melodies. He does six different melodies in any one of those song melodies. And every t he goes through the progression twice. You know, it's like... He goes through the melody twice. And then he comes up with a new melody over the same chords. So the, all the pressure is on the melody writer. Um, and so he did that... <laughs> Each one of those melodies he writes, I want you to listen to that song and check it out just out of curiosity. It's not a very complex harmony. Uh, very simple. Uh, you know, like I said, one, five, two, four. But um, it's a very, uh, the melodies, each one of them could be a standalone song. You could build a song around each one of those six melodies. And it wasn't even a hit. That's what's crazy. I just bought that record because it had a couple hits on it and I really liked it. And I was really trying to study more pop writing. And I, it was kind of when I realized, yeah, I'm not a top line writer. I'll work with top line writers, but I'm not a top line writer. Um, <laughs> they're not playing, Kathy. <laughs> they're, they're not even listening. They got me muted. They're just, this is the only reason I have. How many, how many people are watching right now? Uh, hold on. Oh, it says 40. Is that right? Yeah. The only reason I have 40 people watching, you've basically got 37 people just there to, to chat with each other. Has nothing. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy how all the elements can come together to create a really good song. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, almost all have, they almost all have to, all the elements almost have to work in some way. Um, and... You know, and some sometimes it, like it, the song, if it was missing one of the elements, the harmony or the rhythm or the lyrics or the melody or the production, if it was missing any one of those things, um, you wouldn't have a you wouldn't have a hit. You wouldn't have, you know have a song that anyone would know. I mean, I'm talking. We can go back to Hotel California. We can go all the way. You know, you can go all the way back to any doo wop song or Elvis song, or um, we could talk about a lot of songs, and they're. It's, it's kind of like this, the sum of its whole, you know, some of its parts. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, you can take any one of those parts away and it, the song might not have survived. I'm certainly like, Hound Dog probably wouldn't have been a smash if Elvis wasn't singing it. Um, uh, and so that, you even got that factor, who's actually, cheers. I didn't touch my face up. Tom's not having a beer. No, it's Diet Coke, you guys. I think I own Coca-Cola stock, so I, and I own Starbucks stock, too. 
Mark is doing good today. In fact, my son came over and he was like, I love it when my kids ask me for stock advice. And I don't ever tell them specific stocks, but um, Alex bought uh, Southwest Airlines yesterday. So the airlines went crazy yesterday. Um, and he bought that and he also bought, I think, uh, Exxon. Um, cause you know, the, the oil stocks were hammered because of the economy. Um, so we'll see. I didn't sell anything. I, you know, I sold one thing. Um, and it was at the worst of it, but, um, I sold it because it was, it was basically just an income fund that I, I had money in for emergency. So I didn't want to lose that if it was going to tank. So we sold it and then bought back in a couple weeks ago. Okay. So <laughs> you didn't come here for this. Um, I do, I do have a, you know, I do have a thing where I, I used to do a lot of uh, financial coaching for people, um, which is funny because, but I was always been a big saver since I was a kid. And um, uh, I created this list of tips for savings. And it was like a seven page document or something like that. And I would scan it or I would print them up and people would, you know, cause they would ask me for copies of it. So I would give them copies and, and it was everything from just get like credit, pay your credit card bill every month um, to, you know, get miles for your credit card. Um, uh, you know, spend time to get a savings. If you're buying a car and you can save a thousand dollars, you didn't save a thousand dollars. You saved however much you'd have to make to keep a thousand dollars. So if you're at a 50% tax bracket, you would have to save a thousand dollars. You would have to make two thousand dollars. Does that make sense? So really, if you save a thousand dollars by making an extra drive or an extra phone call, and you're at a 50% tax bracket, you really save two thousand dollars. Anyway. Now, I, I bought this house with money I made in the stock market, so I totally disagree with that, Dennis. I'm sorry. <laughs> I made money on, a lot of money on Intel and Walmart and McDonald's and Starbucks and, yeah, it's, I, I'm a buyer and holder and I, I don't buy commodities because I don't. Hello from Spain. Hola. Hola, amigo. Of course, <laughs> Well, to, right now, today would be a bad day to buy because it's up a thousand points. So uh, the NASDAQ is within 1% or maybe it's surpassed its all-time high today. So, yeah. Now, the drag is when I sold my stocks, I had to pay capital gains on them. So that was a bummer. But I knew that going in. And I reinvest all my dividends. So if I ever get to a point in my life where I need more income in my monthly income, I can just literally flip a switch one switch and it'll revert all of my dividends instead of being built back going back into buying stock um uh it will go back to um uh be paying at paying out so then i have more monthly income if i need it so um yeah exactly simmer stock on low exactly buy good companies well dennis i forget where you are and I, I, ha I, I have bought, I did like one time, at one point we bought a Volvo and I don't generally buy stocks based in foreign countries uh, because not that I can control the laws here, but at least have a vote here. And in, I've, we owned Volvo and when Volvo uh, split their truck from their car, I wanted the car division, but I didn't get a voice because I wasn't a, a Swedish citizen. And so I just ended up with the truck division. I sold it because I didn't like that. So yeah, yeah. And Alex was really totally into this. And he goes, if I, cause he, he's, he's working on a lot of records right now. He's getting paid a lot of money to produce records. So he's like, if I just sit, if I leave that money in there, I'm just going to buy gear with it. And I said, yeah, he goes, I don't want to do that. He goes, I already got what I need. I, he goes, I'm just, I'm going to let it work for me. I'm going, that's smart. You have more freedom, you know, especially in the music business. I mean, there are times where you, you know, to, and I've told you this, um, there were times where I had to literally take two weeks off from work just to work, just to create content for an opportunity that came my way. And so I couldn't make, I was making, if I didn't have savings, I couldn't have done that. Um, and then ultimately that paid off huge. I made a thousand times what I would have made in that week 
or those two weeks. So, so yeah, it's, it's having savings as a musician, say having savings period. In fact, people said, you know, I had a, a neighbor that said, Hey, um, uh, <laughs> he, a friend of my neighbor said, I have a thousand dollars. Should I buy Apple stock with it? Uh, and I said, well, what does your wife say? She said, well, we should save it. I said, I said, do that. <laughs> Cause there's two reasons. One, if you, buy Apple stock with it. And had he bought Apple stock with it, he would have doubled it in a year. Um, but my point was more important is it's better to have savings because what if all of a sudden you need to buy four new tires for your car? Now you got to put it on a credit card and now you don't have the money to pay the bill. Now you've got to, you know, um, uh, now you've got to pay credit card interest rates on a stupid car tires, which you could have paid cash for if you hadn't bought, uh, you know, Apple stock. Um, and the second thing is it's because your wife said so. But I always say, you know, you need to have three to six months living expenses and savings. Um, uh, just in case. And, <laughs> and lo and behold, COVID shows up and proves everyone right about this. So, um, yeah, you're in, Dennis, you're in, uh, I can't see that flag. I think you're in Amsterdam. I mean, you're in Holland, I think. Think. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure the Holland. You know, there's a lot of European companies that you know have done very well. But Alex bought uh, Airbus is one of the companies he bought. Boeing is a little. You know, Boeing's got nice uh, defense contracts. Um, Airbus. I told him. I said, I think Airbus is probably the largest corporation in France. So I can't imagine France would ever allow Airbus to go under. Um, but that doesn't necessarily. Yeah, that's called an emergency fund. Exactly. I know. How hard is this to understand? You start there. You save for that. You know, I mean, you know managing an apartment building for 30 years, uh, for 25 years, astonished me how, how few people didn't think that way. You know, and they, they'd go to Vegas for a week, and then, then they'd be, oh, I'm going to be late with rent. I'm like, well, Really? Isn't that your first bill to pay? <laughs> a, literally a roof over your head? Isn't that the first one you're going to prioritize? Yeah, I, uh, Kathy says, I, I figure I'll just work for a few more years. I, um, yeah, stocks are liquid if they're in a brokerage account or something like that. If they're in an IRA, no, they're not as liquid. You have, in America, if you have a, a retirement account, if you, if you, take money out of your retirement account before it's time, you have to pay tax on it, which is totally fine. Um, but there are, there are certain penalties for it, but it's not, it's not completely unaccessible money, but you're right. Yeah, definitely you want to have liquid assets. Um, so. Yeah, a year would be great. If you can have a year of, of savings, that would be great, so. Um, now, again, like with um, uh, Kathy was saying, if you figure a few more years and I will retire. Um, I don't plan on retiring um, I, unless my hands won't do what I'm telling them to do. Almost every, I mean, I work with people that are 20 years old. I'm, I'm going to be 59 next month. Um, I work with 35-year-old film composers, and they will, will, would never call anybody else but me. Um, so as long as I can deliver what's expected of me, of my clients, um, uh, and, you know, believe it or not, the pop producers I work with and the pop artists that I work with, they seem not to care how old I am. So we'll see if that continues. Um, but as long as the phone's ringing, I'm working. Um, and so, and then most, most of my income actually is residual income. So most of my income is I'm being paid for stuff I've already done. So if I stopped working today, I'd still have income, but I just have, I, I continue to build into that pipeline. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Now, Vito, you're that's, it's totally expected when you're a student, you're not expected to have any savings. That's okay. Uh, you're, you're, what you're doing. In fact, uh, people would say, talk about rent in California. Like, why would you pay such high rent and everything like that? I'm like, cause you can't afford to buy a house. You know, you don't, you need a big down payment for a house and everything. But, um, I never considered it rent. I called it, I called it an access fee to Hollywood. Um, cause I could rent the same apartment for a third of the price in Indiana, but I'd have no access to Hollywood. And now I'm, 
I'm benefiting from that fruit. Uh, but a lot of people, if they're here and they're paying high rent and they're working in a field that could be done anywhere, then, yeah, that I don't understand. I don't understand why you would rent and live in California unless you just loved California, which I totally understand that. It's a beautiful state. Um, so, um, yeah, Gary, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, is Gary's uh, said Gary said that uh, my plan for retirement was to play for the isolated, but I wonder if we'll ever be allowed in the nursing home or a hospital again. I know it when my mom was in a nursing home, you know, when she lived with us, she it was a lot of work, and then it got to the point where it was more work than we could handle, and probably we probably had her six weeks longer than we should have. Um, so we ended up putting her into a nursing home, which was literally behind us, so I could actually see. If I took the trash down to the dumpster at our building, I could see her window, which was so cool, you know, to have her be in the building uh, for a couple of years, a few years, and then to have her in the building behind us. Um, but uh, we, we, we would go, Beth would go there for dinner and every night they would have a different person entertaining. They had an Elvis impersonator once a week show up. The next night they were, someone did jazz standards. They had, you know, singers. and It was really, really cool. I mean, it was like, and I mean, I, I guess these people got paid. I'm assuming they got paid a little bit, a little something. So, okay, I touched my face so we can take a sip. But that's, uh, Gary, that's a really sweet ministry. And I, I hope that that will, I think, I think this too shall pass. Um, and you will be able to go back into that, you know, I call it a ministry, but um, into that uh, model. Um, uh Let's see. <laughs> what happened? I missed something. Bonnie, uh, Dennis, be careful what you call her. <laughs> she makes your food. Oh. <laughs> we call it, we, we say we have a fairy tale marriage, but when I get home, the witch is waiting for the sofa. Because <laughs> there's witches in fairy tales. Very good. Very good. Oh my gosh. My wife is blonde and she likes blonde jokes. So she would, she taught inner city, um, uh, inner city, uh, junior high for years and years and years. And she'd always have a blonde joke at the ready and the kids loved it because none of them were blonde. They just thought they were the best jokes. Uh, they loved her. I, I, I have kids reach out to me still like on Facebook and say, Hey, are you Mrs. Straley's husband? Cause she was my favorite teacher. She, I went to college because of her. She she made such a huge impact, you know, a uh, big, big impact, far bigger than putting a, a black square on your Facebook page or your Instagram thing. You know, it's like, oh, great, you know. But my wife actually, like, was out there five days a week with inner city kids, gang kids, you know, and and she, had, she was hard on them. I mean, she was tough, 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 and she made them work, work, work. If they're working, they can't get into trouble. And at the end of the year, these gang kids <laughs> would cry because they're going to miss her. <laughs> at the end of the school year, they would cry. Uh, Kathy, question. Let's see. Not the... Let's see. Oh, okay. Hey, Kathy. Uh, getting st any stretch advice to avoid repetitive strain injury? Oh. Um, Kathy, I, let me just show what I do every day. Um, the older I get... Um, thank you, Bruce and, and uh, David. Oh, no, uh, Gary. Um... For one thing, you know, I, I get it. When you're practicing something um, and you're really working one specific thing on the guitar, strumming, I don't think you're going to have much. I mean, some people might have carpal tunnel or wrist injury or wrist issues from strumming or from finger. I, I get, when I'm doing flamenco stuff, I get my top of my hand gets sore, but the pain goes away once I stop doing the work. If it continued afterwards, then I might be a little concerned. Uh, but one of the things I do is when I'm going for my walk, to go get my coffee in the morning. And I'm sure people think I'm a little weird, but it, you know, I'm just going through different, um, and I never push hard. I always do different things, you know, like, you know, like just that, just kind of give it a little push, um, this way, this way, you know, and again, I'm not a doctor. I, I will cross my fingers like this. I mean, David, you tell me if I'm doing anything that's 
dangerous. I'm not doing now. When a year ago, a little over a year ago, when we were getting ready to move, we get, you know the how they accepted our offer in the house. I was going through my office and I was looking at things. Oh, how heavy is this? And I went to my giant black desk and I picked it up like I tried to pick it up like this, and my finger snapped right here. It was like ah, oh, it snapped, and I thought I broke my finger. So my doctor friend took an X-ray and he said, no, no, it's not broken, but you did definitely strain it, and so. Ever since then, it was like it wouldn't close. Well, it was this hand. It wouldn't close like on its own. And so what I would do is I would I would just bend every finger and kind of push. And, and if it if it offers too much resistance, don't force it. But and there's a stretching place that's that just was going to open up right before COVID. And it's people my age and older, you know, where they're flexible. You know, they're not very flexible. And it's like a it's like a Pilates place where they actually stretch you, and they will do the bending and everything, which is, it hurts so bad, but it's really, really good for you. And so that's kind of why I, I just have, you know, I'm walking down the street and I'm just kind of giving a little squeeze here. And sometimes I'll even do this. Okay. I'm trying to get the right angle. And then I'll push down like that a little bit backwards. Okay. Not too far. Don't hurt anything. Again, like I said, it's very, but, uh, white out on the screen with it. Yeah, my mom loved the musicians that came in too. She just loved that. I mean, they just love it, especially old Elvis songs and everybody sings along. They know the words. It's really interesting because it was an Alzheimer's patient. And she, my mom was struggling with uh, memory memory issues. I don't know that she had Alzheimer's. I didn't. We didn't ever get her diagnosed for that, but she definitely had senility. And um, uh, yeah, so the, you know, and then just yeah, just that. I you know sometimes we do this. Most people can't bend their wrist that. You know, but um, anyway, those are they. Uh, you know, actually, I do sit on my, put my legs on my hands too to keep them warm sometimes because you know cold fingers are, are uh, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's what I always say. If you're getting any pain from it, and I'm still, I've like that because of COVID, I can't do it right now. Um, I, I guess I could do like a Zoom one and record it. Um, but, um, I've been talking about this for a long time. I, I get a lot of requests of, you know, I'm not, uh, that my most popular video when people say, well, what about, can I play guitar if I have arthritis? And so I've got, um, Ke Kelly, Kelly Clarkson, Kelly Jekyll, um, the girl that I write songs with sometimes she, um, her dad, uh, was a rheumatologist. He just retired. And so I wanted to interview him. And, and ask, I have like, I think 10 questions for him. Like, is there any over-the-counter medication? Should you, uh, should you do like a, a, a sitz bath for your hands uh, before and after you play guitar? Would that help? You know, is guitar good for your arthritis or is it bad for it? Was it, you know, and of course, these are probably all going to have qualified answers where, well, if it hurts, then it's probably bad for it. But if it doesn't, if it soothes, then it's good, you know, <laughs> so I understand that, uh, you know, but <laughs> yeah, as long as... Uh, tech versus fundamental analysis. Let's see. Uh, where was that? Question from Vito. Probably asking me a question. I, where does the question go? Oh, how far back is it? Sorry. I'm looking for a Vito's question here. Oh, yeah. Uh, David, I saw that white joke. Yeah, I know that one too. Yeah. With the the, the uh, blonde, got, why did the blonde get fired from the M and M factory? Because she she kept throwing away all the W's. Uh, let's see, I'm still looking for a Vito's. It's just evading me. Um, let's see, question from a Vito regarding tech versus fundamental analysis. How far back was that question? Was that way back there? Why am I not seeing this? <laughs> was, was it a stock question? Uh, it's a, uh... Yeah, Avito, I agree too. Well, like I said, it's always good to have savings. Um, I don't know if this thing. I'm going to go, okay. Um, Avito, oh. Hey, Tom. Thoughts on technical versus fundamental analysis. I don't know the difference. I don't know what either of those are. You may have to explain them to me. Um, as, as far as songwriting goes or 
uh, chord progressions, things like that. Um, so let's see what. Um, uh, and you know, here's the cool thing about like the minor sub. So the minor sub thing, you can go the other way too. Remember, you can go major sub. So in that case, you can go three semitones up. Um, uh, yes, uh, sorry, Reed is asking me a question about the Grand Pacific, Pacific, Grand Pacific, I don't even have to say Pacific, <laughs> oh, Pacific, okay, you corrected it, I was like, no, uh, yeah, I played them at, uh, I think the NAMM show, I think I, I saw them at the NAMM show, um, yeah, they're great, the NAMM show is the worst place to see them, I just, uh, you know, I, I'm not really in the market right now for any more acoustics necessarily. I mean, if I saw one I really, really liked, I would probably buy it. But I, I you know, I'm not hitting any stores right now. So um, I've got a list of things I got to pick up. Um, but most of them are weird instruments for for movie scores and things like that. So, um, but but it was, if I remember correctly, it was a very, very nice guitar. Um, Taylor makes really good. The Taylor high end stuff is great. I actually, I really, really like their slot head guitars. Their 12 fret guitars. Those are some of those are really nice. I actually really like their classical, their nylon guitars too. Um, but you know, I've got a more legitimate classical guitar and I really like it. So, um, so a technical is all two lines across each other. Fundamental is one. Oh, yeah, I still don't know what that means. We're talking about music, or we? Oh, balance sheet stuff. Oh, cash flow. Oh, <laughs> so we're talking. About... Uh, here's the thing. I generally, gosh, we're getting so off the subject here. People are going to tune in. They're like, "Well, this isn't talking about chord theory." See if I can see if I can make it about chord progressions or chord. Yeah, chord theory. What is the name of this chat? What did I call it? I don't remember. Chord progressions, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, but the thing that I, uh, uh, when I look at a stock, one of the things I like is dividend growth because I'm a big reinvestor. Um, so I like to reinvest dividends. I like, to, if the stock goes down, uh, you know, then I'm getting it cheaper on a quarterly basis. Uh, so that's one of the things I really like about stock. Generally, buy dividend stocks, not always, uh, but I, you know, you, I have, you can watch. I watched for years analysts analyze trends and stock and things like that. You cannot base anything from this point forward on this point backward. Zero. You can. Ne there's not a. People will say I'm analyzing the market, and I've discovered that every November 30th the market goes up, and it's like. Great, and then this November 30th, it'll go down. So, you know, you cannot, yeah. So any kind of trends in that analytics, uh, historical analytics is worthless. I look at dividend growth, um, uh, and um, and then I, I also make sure I'm diversified. So I don't buy all tech stock companies, you know. I know people that buy one stock. I've got a friend who has a ton of Apple stock, and he's a multimillionaire because of it. Um, it's the only stock he's ever owned, and he swears by it. But, you know, there was a point where Apple could have gone bankrupt. He wouldn't have anything. So that's, I like I don't like to have all my eggs in one basket. Okay. So another thing we can do with chord progressions is we can, and um, I think, Avito, you actually asked about this. Um, I think uh, it was you that posted a song up that said, hey, what is this guy doing? And one other thing we can talk about, too, with chord progressions is if we're going from G to C... We can just go from G to C, right? And that could be your song. In fact, I was like... Nah. 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 So many R&B songs are just 1-4, one, 1-4, four, one, four, one, four. Um, But we can also... You don't just have to go from 1 to 4. You can get to 1. So you go... Right? Now, I'm just kind of doing a bass climb. But I can do chords. It's hard, but... It... Okay, and then go back. You could do the same thing going back down. So I could go... And that can make a chord progression more interesting. I could go chords now, descending. Yeah, right. 
right? Yeah, but you know what would happen, you guys, if Ed did that? <laughs> We'd be all in this alternate reality where Ed owns this giant casino and he's a real jerk. <laughs> we would all be living in that. We would just like be fire, well, kind of living fire bombs everywhere, fighting cars on fire everywhere. We're kind of living that right now. Um, <laughs> so that's where we. Yeah, Amazon's an interesting one. It still doesn't pay a dividend, does it? Right? Amazon doesn't pay a dividend. Amazon's interesting because it's both tech and what I would call a um, uh, a cyclical... A, uh, uh, shoot. Um, I, you could kind of call it a hedge. Uh, not a hedge. The word is... Uh, consumer cyclical, is that right? Basically, stocks like Johnson & Johnson were, you know, no matter where the economy goes, people are still going to need shampoo. And Amazon was kind of one of those things where no matter where the economy goes, people are still going to order stuff, you know, the basic necessities. Like grocery stores might be, you know, might be an example of certainly grocery store stocks did well. My Target stock, I own Target. Um, I owned Walmart for years, and when I sold that to buy the house, I didn't come back and buy it. I bought Target because I... Looked at the numbers and just like Target better. Um, yeah, Ed, Ed would be like Ed. Ed would own every fifty nine Les Paul. See, that's what I do is I just go back in time and buy all the fifty nine Les Pauls because <laughs> um, they were selling for like three hundred dollars back in the seventies. You know, it's like, oh yeah, you want this old Les Paul here? Let's let's route it out and put a whammy bar on it and change the pickups and put single coils and. <laughs> He's like, oh no, no, they did that kind of crap to like vintage, vintage strats. Um, I was just talking to my um, student. Um, sorry, I'm off, off the subject again. We're 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 kind of past the lesson anyway. But, um, <clears throat> um, but oh, just another like another way to get to C from G. Ozzy. You know? uh, Now I'm not actually in the key. I'm going chromatically to C. And that has a totally different vibe. I can even go. Yeah, um, I love ETFs. Um, I have SPY and QQQ. Um, ETFs are great because they're very low expense ratio. And basically they just track the... the, the um, uh, then the, they track the whatever index you're buying the stock on. So um, let's see. Yeah, well, well, you know, we'll see with Amazon. We'll see what happens. I think um, definitely it's an interesting stock. Uh, I and and the thing is, I don't own it, but I do own it because I have mutual funds that have it. I mean, all of you probably, if you have any mutual funds one of their biggest holdings is going to be Amazon. So those are the FANG stocks, F-A-A-N-G. Uh, Facebook, believe it or not, Facebook is actually a pretty big power horse, powerhouse because of the, the advertising aspect of Facebook and the fact that so many people are on it all the time. Um, and then also uh, you know, a Amazon, a Apple, and Netflix, which is kind of interesting, and G is for Google, which is really alphabet, but... Um, SpaceX is not a public company, though. SpaceX is not a public company. And I wish I bought um, Tesla. I just, uh, you know, I just didn't trust it. I'm not a big car stock guy. I've never owned car stocks. Um, and if you look at the PE ratios of the big three automakers, they're very, very, very low. You know, under 10, always single digit. Uh, the The the, the price to earnings ratio is very, very low on car companies. But you look at Tesla and they don't even have a price to earnings because they don't have, they're not making money. Well, he just started making money. So they can actually, but I think the price, the PE ratio was what, 250 or something like that. It's like insanely high. So it's, it's telling you it's a speculative. So um, Volkswagen, maybe, I don't know. I'm just not, um, I'm just not into car stocks per se. Um, Although, you know, I do think ultimately the future is electric cars. And I also think part of the future is autonomous cars. And I also think beyond that is none of us owning cars. And then we just order up, you know, my vision of the future is, you know, I've got a, I've got a session. 
Um, I order up a van. Um, I get my gear out to the front. They, we put it in the back of the van. Um, I sit in the back of the van, you know, in the back seat, and uh, they send me uh, the music so I can be listen, looking at it before on my way to the session. And there's nobody driving the van, and it goes on surface streets all the way to Hollywood uh, on surface streets 60 miles an hour. Uh, because everybody, all the cars are talking to each other. They're all autonomous. They're all talking to each other. And uh, they don't need freeways anymore because they can turn the city streets into freeways uh, because they're just all connected and they just know, okay, here comes a bunch of cars. We're all going to stop. Okay, now we'll go and that kind of thing. Or they won't even ever have to stop. They'll just time them. They'll slow down a little bit just so that they can... It'll be trains and trains and trains of cars. Is my speaker whistling again? Not my speaker. Maybe on your end. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, um, well, ETF, yeah, they, yeah, never go, you know, uh, uh, and I've, I've lost everything on some stocks I bought, um, back in, uh, um, <laughs> we're talking about this stuff. So funny. Um, so back during the dot com boom, uh, we're talking 98, 99, 97, 98, 99, everybody's like making money hand over fist. You got to get into this. And, uh, and I'm like, and I, I had some money and I thought, well, you know, I'll take a third, I'll put it in GE, a third I put into, what did I, buy? oh, Cisco, and a third I put into a company called Metro Media Fiber. And the reason I chose those three companies were because they weren't dot coms. I felt like a lot of these dot coms, and Amazon may have been one of those at the time, um, but there was also music.com and school.com and dogs.com and cats.com and phones.com and everybody was pouring millions and billions of dollars into these somebody that just happened to copyright or get that domain and they go oh, we're going to be like the place where everybody toys.com was another one it's like we're going to be and i'm just like no no i'm not investing in those so i look back at a company that back during the gold rush in 1849 in california there was a company that sold pickaxes <laughs> and that company was wells fargo they're still around so i said well who's the pickaxe company of the internet age the coming internet age at that point point?" and i didn't want to buy aol didn't believe in it and i would have made a lot of money probably on aol had i done it i got bought by at&t and stuff i did own at&t um but i bought metro media fiber because they were the largest uh fiber maker they made the fiber the you know the fiber that everybody was going to need and i bought it and it went down and i went well i still think it's a good company so i bought more of it and so i lost a bunch of money on it because it went to zero and of course it got named i got named in like i don't know 10 different class action lawsuits and I, i've never seen a penny from any of them because what are they going to get the money from there's there's nothing there so um yeah, there's a lot of those kind of things. And, you know, I bought, so when when the housing collapse happened in 2009, um, I also had been reading articles about what industries succeeded. We talked about this before, I think. What industries succeeded uh, during the Great Depression? There were two industries that did well, hair salons, because women wanted to feel taken care of or rich. You know, it was a, one, it was a little treat they could do that would make them feel like they weren't poor. And movies. Uh, the movie industry thrived during the Great Depression and theaters thrived because people needed to escape and it only cost a nickel and people could scrape together a nickel to go to a movie and escape for two hours. Um, and so I was thinking, well, what is that thing that people are going to want to get that's going to make them still feel like they're rich? And I'd, ne I'd been going to Starbucks, but I didn't own Starbucks stock. And Starbucks stock was beat down to like $8 or $9, $10, something like that. So I just went and bought a bunch of Starbucks because I thought, you know, this may be one of those things where people just go, they just feel like they are still okay if they can pay $5 for a cup of coffee. I know it, it, it was weird, but it turned out to be true. <laughs> yeah, hair salon stock would have been bad two months ago. <laughs> now it's good. There's no such thing, you know. I guess, I guess, but, you know, super cuts or something like that if they're a public company. Um yeah, and I generally, well, and I don't want, see, I generally shy away from, uh, like I said, I've never really bought an airline stock, would never buy a cruise stock. I 
don't like travel stocks in general, and I'm not a fan of retail. I've bought a little bit of retail, um, but I'm just not a big fan on it. But it's not horrible. It's just, you know, like Macy's or stuff like that. Um, so it's probably I've done well on that. I do like REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust, which by law they have to distribute to the shareholders 95% of their profits. So, and because we could never afford to buy a house, you know, I was like, well, I can kind of own real estate if I own REITs. And so, because when you, own, you know, they have REITs that are shopping mall REITs. In fact, um, a friend of mine I went to high school with is CEO of the biggest one. Uh, he's uh, David Simon. He's Simon Properties Group. He's the CEO. Um, I went to high school with him. I'm, I don't I don't think he would remember me. He might, but, um, um, and um, that was his dad's company. Um, but, yeah, airline stocks are very volatile because there's so many things that can affect them, and we've we've only seen that. And of course, if there's a resurgence in the COVID or anything like that next year, um, those stocks are going to get hammered. So, but people are making money this week on them. I'll tell you what. Um, and so, uh, but but real estate investment trusts. So you could buy stock, real estate investment uh, REITs that specialize in shopping malls, or apartment buildings, or hospitals, or office space. And I have. I had some that were office uh, based, and I do think that those are going to be hurt um, because um, I feel like so many people, so many companies got their staff to work from home through all this that they may very well say, we're going to cut back on half of our office space. If, if half of you are willing to work from home, we'll give you a bonus or something like that. But to be honest, if you're working from home, you're saving money. You don't have to commute. You don't have to buy lunch. You don't have to, you don't have to buy clothes. <laughs> so... Um, Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly right, Bruce. Bruce is saying in Northern Virginia, there were tons of those, you know, dot-com fail jobs. I mean, so many. Here, give you an example. The NASDAQ in, I think, 2000, the beginning of 2000, hit um, 5,000, okay? When it crashed, it got down to 1,100, almost losing 80% of its value, the NASDAQ. And I had QQQ. At the time, it was 4Q, QQQQ. And the NASDAQ now is trading, what, 7,000? I forget what it is. Today, it might break a record. Um, it was within 1% today, I think, of its all-time high. Uh, but it took, it didn't come back to that, it didn't come back to its previous record until last year or the year before, like 18 or 19. So it took... 20 years to come back. That's how bad the dot-com thing took the NASDAQ. Um, and just, you know, like I said, I lost a, quite a bit of money on um, uh, on Metro Media Fiber. Um, GE I eventually got rid of because that stock was just a dog. It just couldn't fight its way back. And then Cisco I still own from way back then. And I don't think I'm back to where I was, which is so sad. I mean, Cisco was a good call for the internet age, you would think. Uh, but it got so hammered. All techs got so hammered. I mean, Apple almost went completely bankrupt. If it wasn't for Steve Jobs coming back, uh, there were, Apple would not exist today. This is no way. Um, and Jobs was a weird guy, you know, interesting guy. He was a, you know, crazy. So um, I sure know a lot of successful, famous people. No, I'm just old. <laughs> Wait a minute. The NASDAQ is 98.33. Is that right? No. I don't remember that number. Come on. Show me the NASDAQ. There we go. Oh, you're right. 98.33. So it's way back. Okay. So historically, let me look at this. Because I, I... Wow. It's, it's almost doubled from there. But when did it hit... 5,000. Yeah, see, here's where... Oh, I guess it only hit 3,900 in... So I'm off. And it's showing it down to, like... For some reason, I thought it hit 5,000. Oh, shoot. Let me go back. 5, max. Of course, it could be... The weighting could be changed, too, depending on who, what companies have been taken in and out of it. I mean, it says that basically in November... 13, it came back to where it was. But for some reason, I got the impression it was it wasn't until it hit 5,000 that it was back to its old high. So I don't know. But that's great. Yeah, NASDAQ. And I, I have 
three Q still. So I never got rid of that. It's up. So let's see. Is it? Is it up? Is it, is it a record yet? I don't know. I'm not sure, but it's pretty crazy. Um, you know, and the, and and the Nasdaq now isn't just. See, I've I've lost all my viewers. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm invested in China. Um, here, okay, now let me tell you something else I do. Okay, I, and I, I broke my own rule with that. I bought a couple stocks in China uh, last year. Um, and I, I'm, I'm making no recommendations on any of these. When I name these stocks, I'm not making recommendations. I would never do that. Uh, what I would do is say, get into the market, do your research, do due diligence, be diversified. Um, but the Volvo stock taught me that I, I generally don't want to own stocks that are corporately based out of the country. However, um, one of the things that I, when I first bought McDonald's, 50% of their stores were out of the country and 50% were in the U.S. When I sold McDonald's at a huge profit, and part of the reasons I love that stock was because they made a major effort overseas. And so they had... 80% of their stores at the time I sold the stock, 80% uh, of McDonald's were out over, outside the U.S. Um, so the corporation was still based in the U.S. It was still governed by U.S. laws. Uh, but m so much of the revenue was coming from all over the world uh, because you really have a limited audience if you stay only in the U.S. Um, and so um, that's definitely... Um, uh, um, you know, an example where I would, I definitely like stocks that are well run and have a worldwide presence. Um, and there's a lot of stocks like that. Um, but I have bought two Chinese stocks in the last year. One is uh, IQ, which is the Netflix of China. And it's not done well, but I, I'm not, you know, I'm not concerned. I thought it would have been done well through the COVID thing, like Netflix has just exploded. Um, but, um, I bought that and then, uh, oh, oh, Nova Nordisk. Yep. Um, I, I remember that stock. Tencent was one that I, I thought about. Um, but instead of Tencent, I bought IQ and I think IQ is a spinoff of Tencent. I think Tencent, if that, you may be saying that, Avito, you, you're a smart kid, man. If you know this stuff, um, I think IQ was a spinoff of Tencent. The symbol is just IQ. Um, it's Ikigi or whatever. If you talk to someone from China, they know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and then the other one I bought that's done very well, but I only bought like 20 shares or something. It was like stupid. I should have bought more, but I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I just kind of was like, oh yeah, this company too. I like this one. It was a company called Bili Bili. B-I-L-I-B-L-B-I-L-I. And it's the symbol is B-I-L-I. And now it's up pretty high. I don't know that it would be worth investing in, but um, I mean, I, I don't know. I think I paid 13 for it. It's trading at 30 or something. So um and I, like I said, I didn't buy hardly any of it. I just had like a little bit of cash left in the account. I went, oh, let me buy something else. Because I was like, I'll be speculative with this. Um, I've done that. I bought like little baby pharmaceutical companies um, for, you know, seven, eight dollars. And instead of buying, you know, 100 shares or, you know, whatever, I maybe buy 500 shares. And those sometimes pay off. Um, but I'm, ne I'm not a day trader. So I generally only look for companies that I'm planning on holding for a long term. So... Yes, I, I have a company that I really like. I've been with one of the first companies I ever invested in, and I still own the stock. And I love this stock. It's called RPM, and they make, uh, they own uh, Rust-Oleum. Um, they're a chemical stock, and they, uh, they're just, they, they just chug along, and they keep, as long as you keep paying your dividend and keep reinvesting it, it's pretty crazy how, how it can build up. My son is, like, really into it all of a sudden. So that's really, both of my sons are really into it, so... That's always encouraging to me. I think it's one of those things. And I, I've, I've met with uh, young people uh, all the time about this and sat down with them and showed. And my suggestion, oh gosh, I'm, I'm not talking about guitars. I apologize. Anybody's checking in now is like, okay, we stopped talking about guitars. But um, uh, my suggestion is to everybody is to create a fictitious portfolio on Yahoo and go, go to Yahoo. If you have an account at Yahoo, go to your Yahoo account, create a portfolio, and put five stocks in it, and try to make them diversified. Five diversified stocks, and put, here we go, you're going to get a sip here, $10,000 in each stock, okay? So buy $10,000 of Sony, $10,000 of Macy's, uh, British Petroleum, uh, um, uh, 
uh, Wells Fargo and McDonald's. You know, you pick five different sectors um, and 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 see and watch and see how it does and save your money in the meantime um, and watch and see how they do. And th this way you get used to seeing valuations go up and down. You know, your portfolio is going to go down to 40,000 from your 50,000. It may go up to 80,000 and it may come back down to 20. And, you know, it, it will it will inoculate you from any of the your expectations to the higher or to the lower. Uh, you know, I, I do feel like um, a lot of people think they're only going to make money on the stock market. It's just not how it works. Uh, but I also think there are people that would say, yeah, you don't bet on that. The only people that make money in the stock market are the insiders. No, it's not at all how it works either. So, uh, and I'm not a fan of commodities. I, as a kid, when I first moved to LA, I lost $2,500 on a, uh, a Petro Media, a Petro Lewis, uh, they bought uh, oil rigs and uh, that were abandoned and they went in with their technology and got oil out of abandoned rigs, which was great. And they were making buku bucks and they were doing really well. And so I got into a limited partnership with them when I was 20 and on my broker's advice. And did really well for a while. Um, for in fact, I reinvested all those dividends, and so I ended up not losing that much money, but I did kind of lose a little bit, which I shouldn't have because I had been reinvesting the dividends. And um, uh, but it was kind of what happened was the oil went down to eleven dollars a barrel, and the company practically went bankrupt, and I lost all the money, or I got out, but I I didn't lose all of it, but I got out, and. Um, don't know what would have happened if I kept it. It's funny because I found those certificates recently because <laughs> I had I had new you know stuff on it that I kept and I don't know why but um, and uh, so it kind of said you know commodities I'm not a big fan of commodities gold I wouldn't buy you know I I because what here's what happens with gold is you know when gold prices get really high then all of a sudden you start seeing these little gold shops opening up all over the place where people can turn in their jewelry and get money and uh, I just I, you know, I'm not a fan of that. So, um, but I do like, um, uh, I like investing in, co in companies because you have all these people that have mortgages to pay. You're investing in people when you invest in companies. So, uh, both my kids finished college debt-free. That's awesome. Well, yeah, we put our kids through college so they don't have any debt. Um, let's see. Oh, that's awesome, Gary. Smart. 100% interest. Yeah, you can't you can't beat that. And that's one of the things I, uh, you know, when people say we work for a company and the company offers them a matching contribution, I always say take it because you're doubling your money right out of a shoot. But I also said that all your other investments should have nothing to do with your company. And I have family that uh, on my wife's side that they work for a company and they put all their money in that company. I'm like, don't do it. And of course, a lot of them lost a lot of money when different things hit. So... Yeah, I, I heard that baseball is probably not going to be playing. The NBA is going to do it, but I think baseball, they can't come to an agreement. It's kind of sad. Really bummer. Um, let's see. Uh, for the new folks that join us, Tom, Tom will post a link to Discord. Where the Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I should do that now. In fact, I need to get off and, and get to work. I got a lot of stuff to do. Got a couple calls and texts and emails I have to answer. So, uh, So here's the Discord. Where is it? Oh, check out that Neo song, too, like I said. That thing is really, 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 it's amazing. Just listen to the melody, how it keeps changing melody. And every one of those melodies he does is beautiful. Just like killing it. It's like any one of those could have been a song by itself. And yet he was very, very, very generous with melodies. So there's the Discord link. Yeah, the NBA will be starting at the end of the, and they're going to do a 22-game playoff, I think. And, and they're all going to be in Disney World. So that's going to be interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, the pay... Cap. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, gold is, you know, one of those things. And I think uh, who, I know that, uh, yeah, uh, biotech. Yeah, bio, oh, so many people pump and dump. And dump. If you know, you're very not, very intelligent kid, I swear to God. Um, but yeah, biotech companies, I, you know, one of, you know, you're going to, there's some that have just exploded. You, you know, people that invest in it were really lucky. I did make a bunch of money on one pharmaceutical company. Um, 
when uh, my brother-in-law recommended it and I went, oh, okay, you know, I'll buy 300 shares or something. And it was only like 12 bucks a share or something. And I think I sold it for, I think I sold it for $30 a share or something like that about a year later. So I did a lot, you know, like made nine grand on it. But what I did was the company that bought them was GlaxoSmithKline. So I put all that money in GlaxoSmithKline. I said, oh, I'll just go ahead and buy the company that bought the company. And I, I've owned that for over 10 years and it's about where I was when I paid, when I bought it. So I, I haven't made any money on that purchase, but I made money on the originals. So um, anyway, but I had to pay, I had to pay cap gains on, I had to pay cap gains on that original sale because they actually bought the stock. It wasn't a stock trade. I've had that. I've got, I've got stock in Tim Hortons that I got because I owned Wendy's. Wendy's bought Tim Hortons, then they sold it. And then... <laughs> So then I got these, I got a hundred shares of Tim Hortons and I'm like, I don't know how to sell it. It's based in Canada. It's like so complex. I tried to get rid of it. Just so I, I just rather have the cash and put it in something else. I mean, it pays a dividend, but it, it comes every you know quarter. I get a $36 check or something like that. I'm like, no, it was, no, it's not even that. It's like a $9 check. I'm like, eh, I just rather have the $2,000. Just give it to me, you know, but I can't. It's so like the paperwork, my account, I mean, my, uh, my broker can't figure it out. He's like, this is doesn't make any sense. And we sent them the paperwork and then they said, you didn't do it right. And it's like, oh, so. Uh, currently studying and paper trading. Okay. <laughs> careful, Avita, be careful. Uh, but yeah, I know you want to be an engineer. That's a very, very smart. That's And you know, one of the biggest, best investments you can make and you see, and I'm not saying guitars are a big investment, but investing in yourself and in your business and in your growth, uh, because you're going to see returns on that if you are a hard worker and you've got a good model. So, yeah, I know that's the great thing about um, trading now is I can even trade through my Chase account for free. So, in fact, i got to make a call on that. I, got, I had something I wanted to buy, but it wouldn't let me without going through the broker for some reason. So, anyway, okay, I'm going to sign off. This whole lesson is totally, we got to be careful. Because I could literally talk about this for hours and hours, obviously. Um, Dan Diane, you're going to have to remind me about that story next time, okay? Um, and uh, and uh, we'll... Um, I think I told the story before. I'm trying to come up with some new stories. I'm trying to remember. It's just I get in the moment and I can't think of them. So, But God bless you all for watching and hanging out with us. And I think we peaked at uh, 50. Look at that. 50. Sweet. And then we had another peak at 46 and... So uh, I don't know how many, we'll see. I'm going to end the stream right now. Talk to you later. See you Monday.